This is pages 48 to 61 of The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. As you read today, think about what lessons Jeanette's parents teach the children. Page 48. A few months after Maureen was born, a squad car tried to pull us over because the brake lights on the green caboose weren't working. Dad took off. He said that if the cops stopped us, they'd find out that we had no registration or insurance and that the license plate had been taken off another car and they'd arrest us all. After barreling down the highway, he made a screeching U-turn with us kids feeling like the car was going to tumble over on its side. But the squad car made one too. Dad peeled through Blythe at a hundred miles an hour, ran a red light, cut the wrong way up a one-way street, and the other car is honking and pulling over. He made a few more turns, then headed down an alley and found an empty garage to hide in. We heard the sound of the siren a couple blocks away, and then it faded. Dad said that since the Gestapo would have their eyes out for the green caboose, we'd have to leave it in the garage and walk home. The next day, he announced that Blythe had become a little too hot and we were hitting the road again. This time, he knew where we were going. Dad had been doing some research and settled on a town in northern Nevada called Battle Mountain. There was gold in Battle Mountain, Dad said, and he intended to go after it with the prospector. Finally, we were going to strike it rich. Mom and Dad rented a great big U-Haul truck. Mom explained that since only she and Dad could fit in the front of the U-Haul, Lori, Brian, Maureen, and I were in for a treat. We got to ride in the back. It would be fun, she said, a real adventure, but there wouldn't be any light, so we would have to use all our resources to entertain one another. Plus, we were not allowed to talk. Since it was illegal to ride in the back, anyone who heard us might call the cops. Mom told us the trip would only be about 14 hours if we took the highway but we should tack on another couple of hours because we might make some scenic detours. We packed up what furniture we had. There wasn't much, mostly parts for the prospector and a couple of chairs and mom's oil paintings and art supplies. When we were ready to leave, mom wrapped Maureen in a lavender blanket and passed her to me, and we kids all climbed into the back of the U-Haul. Dad closed the doors. It was pitch black and the air smelled stale and dusty. We were sitting on the ribbed wooden floor, on frayed, stained blankets used to wrap furniture, feeling for one another with our hands. "'Here goes the adventure,' I whispered. "'Shh,' Lori said. The U-Haul started up and lurched forward. Maureen let loose with a loud, high-pitched wail. I shushed her and rocked her and patted her, but she kept crying. So I gave her to Lori, who whispered sing-song into her ear and told jokes. That didn't work either, so we begged Maureen to please stop crying. Then we just put our hands over our ears. After a while, it got cold and uncomfortable in the back of the dark U-Haul. The engine made the floor vibrate, and we'd all go tumbling whenever we hit a bump. Several hours passed. By then, we were all dying to pee and wondering if Dad was going to pull over for a rest stop. Suddenly, with a bang, we hit a huge pothole and the back doors on the U-Haul flew open. The wind shrieked through the compartment. We were afraid we were going to get sucked out, and we all shrank back against the prospector. The moon was out. We could see the glow from the U-Haul's taillights, and the road we'd come down, stretching back through the silvery desert. The unlocked door swung back and forth with loud clangs. Since the furniture was stored between us and the cabin, we couldn't knock on the wall to get Mom's and Dad's attention. We banged on the sides of the U-Haul and hollered as loud as we could, but the engine was too noisy and they didn't hear us. Brian crawled to the back of the van. When one of the doors swung in, he grabbed at it, but it flew open again, jerking him forward. I thought the door was going to drag Brian out, but he jumped back just in time and scrambled along the wooden floor toward Lori and me. Brian and Lori held tight to the prospector, which Dad had tied securely with ropes. I was holding Maureen, who, for some strange reason, had stopped crying. I wedged myself into a corner. It seemed like we'd have to ride it out. Then, a pair of headlights appeared way in the distance behind us. We watched as the car suddenly caught up with the U-Haul. After a few minutes, it pulled up right behind us, and its headlights caught us there in the back of the cab. The car started honking and flashing its brights. Then, it pulled up and passed us. The driver must have signaled Mom and Dad because the U-Haul slowed to a stop, and Dad came running back with a flashlight. "'What the hell was going on?' he asked. He was furious. We tried to explain that it wasn't our fault the doors blew open, but he was still angry. I knew that he was scared, too. Maybe even more scared than angry. "'Was that a cop?' Brian asked. "'No,' 
Dad said, and you're sure as hell lucky it wasn't, or he'd be hauling your asses off to jail. After we peed, we climbed back into the trunk and watched as Dad closed the doors. The darkness enveloped us again. We could hear Dad locking the doors and double-checking them. The engine restarted, and we continued on our way. Pause here and make an annotation jot at the end of this page using our annotation guide on Google Classroom. Battle Mountain had started out as a mining post, settled a hundred years earlier by people hoping to strike it rich, but if anyone ever had struck it rich in Battle Mountain, they must have moved somewhere else to spend their fortune. Nothing about the town was grand except the big empty sky and, off to the distance, the stony purple Tuscarora Mountains running down to the table flat desert. The main street was wide, with sun-bleached cars and pickups parked at an angle to the curb, but only a few blocks long, flanked on both sides with low, flat-roofed buildings made of adobe or brick. A single streetlight flashed red day and night. Along Main Street was a grocery store, a drugstore, a Ford dealership, a Greyhound bus station, and two big casinos, the Owl Club and the Nevada Hotel. The buildings, which seemed puny under the huge sky, had neon signs that didn't look like they were on during the day because the sun was so bright. We moved into a wooden building on the edge of town that had once been a railroad depot. It was two stories tall and painted in industrial green and was so close to the railroad tracks that you could wave to the engineer from the front window. Our new home was one of the oldest buildings in town, Mom proudly told us, with a real frontier quality to it. Mom and Dad's bedroom was on the second floor, where the station manager once had his office. We kids slept downstairs in what had been the waiting room. The old restrooms were still there, but the toilet had been ripped out of one and a bathtub put in its place. The ticket booth had been converted into a kitchen. Some of the original benches were still bolted to the unpainted wood walls, and you could see the dark, worn spots where prospectors and miners and their wives and children had sat waiting for the train, their behinds polishing the wood. Since we didn't have money for furniture, we improvised. A bunch of huge wooden spools, the kind that hold industrial cable, had been dumped on the side of the tracks not far from our house, so we rolled them home and turned them into tables. What kind of fools would go waste money on store-bought tables when they can have these for free? Dad said as he pounded the tops of the spools to show us how sturdy they were. For chairs, we used some smaller spools and a few crates. Instead of beds, we kids each slept in a big cardboard box, like the ones refrigerators get delivered in. A little while after we'd moved into the depot, we heard Mom and Dad talking about buying us kids real beds, and we said they shouldn't do it. We liked our boxes. They made going to bed seem like an adventure. Shortly after we moved into the depot, Mom decided that what we really needed was a piano. Dad found a cheap upright when a saloon in the next town over went out of business, and he borrowed a neighbor's pickup to bring it home. We slid it off the pickup down a ramp, but it was too heavy to carry. To get it into the depot, Dad devised a system of ropes and pulleys that he attached to the piano in the front yard and ran through the house and out the back door, where they were tied to the pickup. The plan was for Mom to ease the truck forward, pulling the piano into the house, while Dad and we kids guided it up a ramp of planks and through the front door. Ready, Dad hollered when we were all in our positions. Okie doke, Mom shouted. But instead of easing forward, Mom who had never quite gotten the hang of driving, hit the gas pedal hard, and the truck shot ahead. The piano jerked out of our hands, sending us lurching forward, and bounced into the house, splintering the doorframe. Dad screamed at Mom to slow down, but she kept going and dragged the screeching, cord-banging piano across the depot floor and right through the rear door, splintering its frame, too, then out into the backyard, where it came to rest next to a thorny bush. Dad came running through the house, "'What the Sam Hill were you doing?' he yelled at Mom. "'I told you to go slow.' "'I was only doing twenty-five, Mom said. "'You get mad at me when I go that slow on the highway.' "'She looked behind her and saw the piano sitting in the backyard. "'Oopsie Daisy,' she said. "'Mom wanted to turn around and drag it back into the house from the other direction, "'but Dad said that was impossible "'because the railroad tracks were too close to the front door "'to get the pickup in position. "'So the piano stayed where it was.' 
On the days Mom felt inspired, she took her sheet music and one of our spool chairs outside and pounded away at her music back there. Most pianists never get the chance to play in the great out of doors, she said. And now the whole neighborhood can enjoy the music too. Pause here and write an annotation from our annotation guide. Page 54. Dad got a job as an electrician in a barite mine. He left early and came home early, and in the afternoons we all played games. Dad taught us cards. He tried to show us how to be steely-eyed poker players, but I wasn't very good. Dad said you could read my face like a traffic light. Even though I wasn't much of a bluffer, I'd sometimes win a hand because I was always getting excited by even mediocre cards, like a pair of fives, which made Brian and Lori think I'd been dealt aces. Dad also invented games for us to play, like the Ergo game, in which he'd make two statements of fact and we had to answer a question based on those statements, or else say, insufficient information to draw a conclusion and explain why. When Dad wasn't there, we invented our own games. We didn't have many toys, but you didn't need toys in a place like Battle Mountain. We'd get a piece of cardboard and go tobogganing down the depot's narrow staircase. We'd jump off the roof of the depot, using an army surplus blanket as our parachute, and letting our legs buckle under us when we hit the ground, like Dad had taught us real parachutists do. We'd put a piece of scrap metal, or a penny, if we were feeling extravagant, on the railroad tracks right before the train came. After the train had roared by, the massive wheels churning, we'd run to get our newly flattened, hot and shiny piece of metal. The thing we'd like to do most was go exploring in the desert. We'd get up at dawn, my favorite time, when the shadows were long and purple, and you still had the whole day ahead of you. Sometimes Dad went with us, and we'd march through the sagebrush military style, with Dad calling out orders in a sing-song chant, Hup, two, three, four and then we'd stop and do push-ups, or Dad would hold out his arm so we could do pull-ups on it. Mostly, Brian and I went exploring by ourselves. That desert was filled with all sorts of amazing treasures. We had moved to Battle Mountain because of the gold in the area, but the desert also had tons of other mineral deposits. There was silver and copper and uranium and barite, which Dad said oil drilling rigs used. Mom and Dad could tell what kind of minerals and ore were in the ground from the color of the rock and soil, and they taught us what to look for. Iron was in the red rocks, copper in the green. There was so much turquoise, nuggets, and even big chunks of it lying on the desert floor that Brian and I could fill our pockets with it until the weight practically pulled our pants down. You could also find arrowheads and fossils and old bottles that had turned deep purple from lying under the broiling sun for years. You could find the sun-parched skulls of coyotes, and empty tortoise shells, and the rattles and shed skins of rattlesnakes. And you could find great big bullfrogs that had stayed in the sun too long, and were completely dried up and as light as a piece of paper. On Sunday night, if Dad had money, we'd all go to the Owl Club for dinner. The Owl Club was world famous, according to the sign, where a hoot owl wearing a chef's hat pointed the way to the entrance. Off to one side was a room with rows of slot machines that were constantly clinking and ticking and flashing lights. Mom said the slot players were hypnotized. Dad said they were damn fools. Never play the slots, Dad told us. They're for suckers who rely on luck. Dad knew all about statistics, and he explained how the casinos stacked the odds against the slot players. When Dad gambled, he preferred poker and pool, games of skill, not chance. Whoever coined the phrase, a man's got to play the hand that was dealt to him, was most certainly one piss-poor bluffer, Dad said. The oil club had a bar where groups of men with sunburned necks huddled together over beers and cigarettes. They all knew Dad, and whenever he walked in, they insulted him in a loud, funny way that was meant to be friendly. This joint must be going to hell in a handbasket if they're letting in sorry-ass characters like you, they'd shout. Hell, my presence here has a positively elevating effect compared to you mangy coyotes, Dad would yell back. They'd all throw their heads back and laugh and slap one another between the shoulder blades. We always sat at one of the red booths. Such good manners, the waitress would exclaim, because Mom and Dad made us say sir and ma'am and yes please and thank you. They're damn smart too, Dad would declare. Finest damn kids ever walked the planet. 
and we'd smile and order hamburgers or chili dogs and milkshakes and big plates of onion rings that glistened with hot grease. The waitress brought the food to the table and poured the milkshakes from a sweating metal container into our glasses. There was always some left over, so she kept the container on the table for us to finish. Looks like you hit the jackpot and got something extra, she'd say with a wink. We always left the owl club so stuffed we could hardly walk. Let's waddle home, kids, Dad would say. The barite mine where Dad worked had a commissary, and the mine owner deducted our bill and the rent for the depot out of Dad's paycheck every month. At the beginning of each week, we went to the commissary and brought home bags and bags of food. Mom said only people brainwashed by advertising bought prepared food such as SpaghettiOs and TV dinners. She bought the basics. Sack of flour or cornmeal, powdered milk, onions, potatoes, 20-pound bags of rice or pinto beans, salt, sugar, yeast for making bread, cans of jack mackerel, a canned ham or a fat slab of bologna, and for dessert, cans of sliced peaches. Mom didn't like cooking much. Why spend the afternoon making a meal that will be gone in an hour, she'd ask us, when in the same amount of time I can do a painting that will last forever. So once a week or so, she'd fix a big cast iron vat of something like fish and rice or usually beans. We'd all sort through the beans together, picking out the rocks, then mom would soak them overnight, boil them the next day with an old ham bone to give them flavor, and for that entire week we'd have beans for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If the beans started going bad, we'd just put extra spice in them, like the Mexicans at the LBJ apartments always did. We bought so much food that we never had much money come payday. One payday, Dad owned the mine company 11 cents. He thought it was funny and told them to put it on his tab. Dad almost never went out drinking at night like he used to. He stayed home with us. After dinner, the whole family stretched out on the benches and the floor of the depot and read, with a dictionary in the middle so we kids could look up words we didn't know. Sometimes I discussed the definitions with Dad, and if we didn't agree with what the dictionary writer said, we sat down and wrote a letter to the publishers. They'd write back defending their position, which would prompt an even longer letter from Dad, and if they replied again, so would he, until we stopped hearing from the dictionary people. Mom read everything. Charles Dickens, William Faulkner, Henry Miller, Pearl Buck. She even read James Michener, apologetically, saying she knew it wasn't great literature, but she couldn't help herself. Dad prefers science and math books, biographies and history. We kids read whatever Mom brought home from her weekly trips to the library. Brian read thick adventure books, ones written by guys like Zane Grey. Laurie especially loved Freddy the Pig and all the Oz books. I like the Laura Ingalls Wilder stories, and the We Were There series about kids who lived at great historical moments, but my favorite was Black Beauty. Occasionally, on those nights when we were all reading together, a train would thunder by, shaking the house and rattling the windows. The noise was thunderous, but after we'd been there a while, we didn't even hear it. Pause here and write an annotation about the lessons that Jeanette's parents teach the children in this section of the book. Mom and Dad enrolled us in the Mary S. Black Elementary School, a long, low building with an asphalt playground that turned gooey in the hot sun. My second grade class was filled with the children of miners and gamblers, scabby kneed and dusty from playing in the desert, with uneven home scissored bangs. Our teacher, Miss Page, was a small pinch woman, given to sudden rages and savage thrashings with her ruler. Mom and Dad had already taught me everything Miss Page was teaching the class. Since I wanted the other kids to like me, I didn't raise my hand all the time the way I had in Blythe. Dad accused me of coasting. Sometimes he made me do my arithmetic homework in binary numbers because he said I needed to be challenged. Before class, I'd have to recopy it into Arabic numbers, but one day I didn't have time, so I turned in the assignment in its binary version. What's this? Miss Page asked. She pressed her lips together as she studied the circles and lines that covered my paper, then looked up at me suspiciously. Is this a joke? I tried to explain to her about binary numbers, and how they were the system that computers used, and how Dad said they were far superior to other numeric systems. Miss Page stared at me. It wasn't the assignment, she said, impatiently. 
She made me stay late and redo the homework. I didn't tell Dad because I knew he'd come to school to debate Miss Page about the virtues of various numeric systems. Lots of other kids lived in our neighborhood, which was known as the Tracks, and after school we all played together. We played red light, green light, tag, football, red rover, or nameless games that involved running hard, keeping up with the pack, and not crying if you fell down. All the families who lived around the tracks were tight on cash. Some were tighter than others, but all of us kids were scrawny and sunburned and wore faded shorts and raggedy shirts and sneakers with holes or no shoes at all. What was most important to us was who ran the fastest and whose daddy wasn't a wimp. My dad was not only not a wimp, he came out to play with the gang, running alongside us, tossing us up in the air, and wrestling against the entire pack without getting hurt. Kids from the tracks came knocking at the door, and when I answered, they asked, Can your dad come out and play? Lori, Brian, and I, and even Maureen, could go pretty much anywhere and do just about anything we wanted. Mom believed that children shouldn't be burdened by a lot of rules and restrictions. Dad whipped us with his belt, but never out of anger, and only if we backtalked or disobeyed a direct order, which was rare. The only rule we had was that we had to come home when the streetlights went on. And use your common sense, Mom said. She felt it was good for kids to do what they wanted because they learned from a lot of their mistakes. Mom was not one of those fussy mothers who got upset when you came home dirty or played in the mud or fell and cut yourself. She said people should get things like that out of their systems when they were young. Once, an old nail ripped through my thigh when I was climbing over a fence at my friend Carla's house. Carla's mother thought I should go to the hospital for stitches and a tetanus shot. Nothing but a minor flesh wound, Mom declared after studying the deep gash. People these days run to the hospital every time they skin their knees, she added. We're becoming a nation of sissies. With that, she sent me back out to play. Pause here and read an annotation about the lessons that Jeanette's parents are teaching Jeanette in this section of the book. Some of the rocks I found while I was exploring out in the desert were so beautiful that I could not bear the idea of leaving them there. So I started a collection. Brian helped me with it, and together we found garnets and granite and obsidian and Mexican crazy lace and more and more turquoise. Dad made necklaces for Mom out of all that turquoise. We discovered large sheets of mica that you could pound into powder and then rub all over your body so you'd shimmer under the Nevada sun as if you were coated with diamonds. Lots of times, Brian and I thought we'd found gold, and we'd stagger home with an entire bucket full of sparkling nuggets, but it was always iron pyrite, fool's gold. Some of it Dad said we should keep because it was especially good quality for fool's gold. My favorite rocks to find were geodes, which mom said came from the volcanoes that had erupted to form the Tuscarora Mountains millions of years ago, during the Miocene period. From the outside, geodes looked like boring round rocks, but when you broke them open with a chisel and hammer, the insides were hollow, like a cave, and the walls were covered with glittering white quartz crystals or sparkling purple amethysts. I kept my rock collection behind the house, next to mom's piano, which was getting a little weathered. Lori and Brian and I would use the rocks to decorate the graves of our pets that had died or of the dead animals we found and decided should get a proper burial. I also held rock sales. I didn't have that many customers because I charged hundreds of dollars for a piece of flint. In fact, the only person who ever bought one of my rocks was Dad. He came up behind the house one day with a pocket full of change and was startled when he saw the price tags I'd taped to each rock. Honey, your inventory might move a little faster if you dropped your prices, he said. I explained that all my rocks were incredibly valuable, and I'd rather keep them than sell them for less than they were worth. Dad gave me his crooked smile. Sounds like you've thought this through pretty well, he said. He told me he had his heart set on buying a particular piece of rose quartz, but didn't have the $600 I was charging, so I cut the price to $500 and let him have it on credit. Brian and I loved to go to the dump. We looked for treasures among the discarded stoves and refrigerators, the broken furniture and stacks of bald tires. We chased after the desert rats that lived in the wrecked cars, or caught tadpoles and frogs in the scum-topped pond. Buzzards circled overhead, and the air was filled with dragonflies the size of small birds. There were no trees to speak of in Battle Mountain, 
but one corner of the dump had huge piles of railroad ties and rotting lumber that were great for climbing and carving your initials on. We called it the woods. Toxic and hazardous wastes were stored in another corner of the dump where you could find old batteries, oil drums, paint cans, and bottles with skulls and crossbones. Brian and I decided some of this stuff would make for a neat scientific experiment, so we filled up a couple of boxes with different bottles and jars and took them to an abandoned shed we named our laboratory. At first we mixed things together, hoping they would explode, but nothing happened, so I decided we should conduct an experiment to see if any of the stuff was flammable. The next day after school, we came back to the laboratory with a box of dad's matches. We unscrewed the lids of some of the jars and dropped in matches, but still, nothing happened. So we mixed up a batch of what Brian called nuclear fuel, pouring different liquids into a can. When I tossed in the match, a cone of flame shot up with a whoosh like a jet afterburner. Brian and I were knocked to our feet. When we stood up, one of the walls was on fire. I yelled to Brian that we had to get out of there, but he was throwing sand at the fire, saying that we had to put it out or we'd get in trouble. The flames were spreading toward the door, eating up that dry old wood in no time. I kicked out a board in the back wall and squeezed through. When Brian didn't follow, I ran up the street calling for help. I saw Dad walking home from work. We ran back to the shack. Dad kicked in more of the wall and pulled Brian out coughing. I thought Dad would be furious, but he wasn't. He was sort of quiet. We stood on the street watching the flames devour the shack. Dad had an arm around each of us. He said it was an incredible coincidence that he happened to be walking by. Then he pointed to the top of the fire, where the snapping yellow flames dissolved into an invisible, shimmery heat that made the desert beyond seem to waver, like a mirage. Dad told us that zone was known in physics as the boundary between turbulence and order. It's a place where no rules apply, or at least they haven't figured them out yet, he said. You all got a little too close to it today. Please pause here, write an annotation about the difference between turbulence and order, according to Jeanette's father. Then return to your table of contents on Google Classroom, and please write a quick summary on page 65.